I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, change may be ahead on a federal policy about gay men and blood donations, but the plan's getting criticism from gay activists. And fewer people are answering the bell of the Salvation Army. Donations way down here in San Diego. From catching criminals to running one of the nation's top hospitals, I'm Amitha Sharma. Tonight we talk with Scripps Healthcare CEO Chris Van Gorder about making healthcare profitable. Also tonight, our cars are getting a lot smarter, but will the car of the future take drivers' minds off the road? And we'll have a look at the fuss over growlers, jugs of beer that aren't always welcome at every brewery. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Gay activists are questioning a federal move tonight to end a ban on blood donations from gay and bisexual men. The Food and Drug Administration says it wants to change the rules, only banning donations from gay men who've had sex in the previous 12 months. Now, the activists say a celibacy requirement is still a de facto ban. The current policy dates back to the beginning of the AIDS crisis as an effort to protect the blood supply. Many medical groups say it's no longer supported by science. The new proposal would put the U.S. in line with other countries. Federal health officials say signups for health insurance are off to a pretty good start nationwide. Uh, state numbers here in California are due out next week. The vast majority of consumers who've signed up for insurance with Covered California this year have gotten help with the enrollment process. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg joins us from our North County Bureau. So, Kenny, uh, folks can enroll in Covered California, a plan on their own. Is that not right? Uh, absolutely. Somebody can go on the Covered California website and go through the entire application process on their own. But what happens when the website goes down or somebody doesn't know how to answer a question? That's why consumer advocates recommend that people get help to get through the process. And remind us what kind of help is available. Well, help is available by phone through Covered California's call center. It's available in person at many different sites in San Diego County, including nine different community storefronts where certified enrollment counselors give free help to people who need to get help enrolling in a health plan. You can also get help at virtually any community clinic in San Diego County where they'll have a, a certified enrollment counselor and also from certain certified private insurance agents. And all of the particulars, including names, addresses, hours of operation, phone numbers, are listed on the Covered California website. And, of course, we are into the second month of open enrollment here in California. How's the process going so far? Well, this year, open enrollment is only three months versus six months last year, but officials say it's going quite well. So far in the first month of open enrollment this year, about 144,000 people have gone through the entire process and selected a health plan. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg. A hazmat team and federal health officials were called to the Otay Mesa border crossing today because of an Ebola scare. Authorities reported a pregnant woman possibly met the profile of an Ebola patient with fever, vomiting, and nausea, and a recent visit to Africa. Turned out she had the flu, and her Africa visit was to Nigeria, which has not had an Ebola outbreak. She was taken to a hospital for treatment. A scary interruption to last night's San Diego State basketball game when forward Dwayne Poley collapsed on the court. He was conscious as he was taken out of Viejas Arena, and he's undergoing tests today at a hospital. Donations to the Salvation Army's Red Kettle Bell Ringers are down 21 percent compared to last year in San Diego County. Although people seem to be shopping more, they're giving less. That's left the charity about $130,000 short of its goal this year. Salvation Army provides meals and other services to families throughout the year and distributes Christmas presents to needy parents. We have seen that a lot of the families that are coming to us are working class poor, are families who are trying to make ends meet, but they are just struggling to make a decision whether to buy toys or pay rent, to buy food or to pay for their utility bills. We have people who are Americans who are in need, who just need our help. 
The Salvation Army says there's still time to give. The Red Kettle campaign is set to end late uh, tomorrow. And of course, you can give online at sandiego.salvationarmy.org. For the second year in a row, San Diego's highway patrol officers gave Christmas gifts to hundreds of children. KPBS reporter Matt Bowler tells us the Chips for Kids program is a thank you to the community. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say. Hundreds of Barrio Logan kids lined up to see Santa and get some new toys. California Highway Patrol played Elf to Chris Kringle, chauffeuring him and over 1,000 toys to the waiting happy kids. Well, it's fantastic to see their eyes light up as we drive in with both Chipper, our mascot, and Santa Claus. It's just the faces, it, it makes it all worth it. Organizer Emily Valverde says toy giveaways like this can change the perception Barrio Logan's kids have about law enforcement. Most of the time kids see the police officers as someone not approachable. This gives them the opportunity to see, well, you know, they can be your friends. And who wouldn't want a new toy and a new friend for Christmas? Matt Bowler, KPBS News. You go down in Chris Van Gorder is the CEO of Scripps Healthcare with thousands of employees, and he says he tries to answer all of their emails. He talked with Amitha Sharma about running a successful company and making healthcare profitable. It's a long road from catching criminals to overseeing an outfit that heals the sick, but that's exactly what Chris Van Gorder did. He went from working as a police officer to running one of the country's top-ranked hospitals, Scripps Health, in San Diego. Van Gorder chronicles his rise and what he learned in a new book called The Frontline Leader. Van Gorder joins me now. You write about a time when you worked the graveyard shift at a hospital as a security guard, and the CEO of that hospital walked right past you without making eye contact. How did that experience shape your view of corporate leadership? Well, it was about two o'clock in the morning and I'd, I knew him by his photograph only. And I saw him coming down the hallway and I went, and there's nobody else. I mean, there's nobody in this basement. And I thought, well, I'm gonna get a chance to thank him for my job and say hello to him. And he walked right by me, no eye contact, like I didn't even exist. And it, it made me feel pretty small at the moment. Um, but right after that, I remembered thinking, you know, if something bad happens in this hospital right now, I'm the first person they're going to call. I'll be that frontline person that ends up dealing with the situation, and he'll be called way after the fact. And it just struck me from that point forward that the most important people in an organization are the people that are really interfacing with the customer, or in our case, the patients. They're the most important people in the organization, and that anybody in a leadership and management position really needs to know that and take care of their people. And so you got into management. You took over Scripps Health in 2000 and have overseen it from teetering finances to profitability and the addition of 5,000 employees. What was key in this turnaround? Oh, there were a lot of things that we ended up doing, but the first thing is starting to build relationship with all of our people. In our case, we started with our physicians and created what we call the Physician Leadership Cabinet uh, under the a uh, hypothesis that I've always had is that if, if smart people are given the same information, they'll reach a similar uh, decision or conclusion. And in fact, our physician leaders now, 15 years later, uh, have agreed with most of the recommendations that have, have been made by management, but we have agreed 100% with the, the, the uh, decisions and recommendations coming out of the physician leadership cabinet. Then we created a, a, a leadership academy and what we call our Employee 100 group so that I could spend time with them, literally either a half a day or a full day um, a month uh, answering questions and letting them understand how the organization really works, but more importantly, listening to them and finding out what issues affect them and then dealing with those issues. And then we balance all of those things, and there's a lot of other things that we've done over the years, with a real sense of accountability. And I meet with every new manager and I draw a little triangle on the board and the three legs of that stool or triangle are responsibility, authority, and accountability. And as I always point out to them, you know, when you want to get promoted, you're looking for more responsibility and more authority. But in all of my years in management, nobody's ever come to me asking for more accountability. And so I tell them at Scripps, if you're going to have responsibility and authority, we're going to hold you accountable. And we have a very strict definition of accountability. And so what has happened over the years? 
people have been accountable. And we've hit all of our targets for 15 years in a row now. So that's on the professional end, but you also yeah. write about the importance of spending time with Correct. employees, getting to know them personally, yeah. bonding with them. Yeah. What effect does that have? Well, number one, it connects me right to what we're doing. I mean, I used to do patient care, and I was at the front line, and I loved that part of working in healthcare. Well, now I'm in a corporate office, and I deal with paper and big numbers. And it's really easy to lose context with what's important unless you're spending time on the front line with your employees. It's your employees that are important. It's that patient that's important. And so, literally, I get out of my office now every Friday. We have a no Friday uh, uh, or no meeting on Friday kind of uh, policy so that I can get out the front lines and spend time with them. You know, I'll work in the emergency rooms at least once a year as a technical partner working for the nurses and making beds and doing all the things that they have to deal with. And, but it, it gives me an ability to see what they're seeing every day and, and have the emotions that they're feeling. And it allows a connection, me with them, them with me. And as a result of that, the decisions that I make, I think, are a lot more employee-centric than they would ever be if I just didn't have a connection with the front line of the organization. Very quickly, um, healthcare has has transformed dramatically in the last decade, even more so with healthcare reform. Right. What what changes can patients expect to see in the near future? Boy, I think you're you're going to see a lot of changes. Everything from different use of technology, care being delivered in people's homes with new technology that's being developed. Probably a focus in healthcare on us keeping people well as opposed to just taking care of them when they're sick. And we're doing that, of course, at Scripps through our genomics program and our, our wireless technology program. So the big transformation is we're moving ourselves from being a sick business to a wellness business. Care being delivered in the community as opposed to care just being in, delivered in hospitals. It's going to be a wonderful change. Dramatic on the hospital side and the, and the health care provider side, but it's going to be really, really good for society in the long run. Chris Van Gorder, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you very much. The founder of one of San Diego's largest defense contractors has died. Dr. J. Robert Beister died yesterday at his home in La Jolla. He was 90 years old. Beister founded Science Applications International Corporation in 1969. Most folks know it as SAIC. Of course, it became the largest employee-owned research and engineering firm in the U.S. In 2007, Beister told KPBS he just wanted a good place to work with a no-hassle environment. Uh, it means that uh, people can act, can participate in the uh, operation of the company and help make the decisions that, uh, that uh, allow the company to flourish. Meister's Family Foundation made contributions to help other San Diego institutions flourish, including UC San Diego, Father Joe's Villages, and KPBS, which recently named the Beister family to our Hall of Fame. A public memorial will be announced in the new year. Sony Pictures will release the movie The Interview on Christmas Day after all, but it's a limited release at only a few independent theaters, none in San Diego, but some in Los Angeles. Last week, Sony pulled the film from wide release because of threats by hackers. President Obama says Sony was the victim of cyber vandalism by North Korea. Today and tomorrow are expected to be the busiest days of the holiday travel season. 55,000 people a day expected to go through the San Diego airport every day up until January 4th. Now, if you're flying, get to the airport at least 90 minutes before your departure time. Federal mediators have offered to get involved in negotiations between longshoremen and shipping lines. Workers have been without a contract since July at 29 West Coast ports, including San Diego. The shippers say the two sides are far apart on many issues. Now, this isn't something we see often in December. The state is suspending burn permits in San Diego and Imperial counties. This only applies to state lands. Campfires are allowed in established campgrounds. No word on how long the order will be in effect. And December is shaping up to be a wet month for California, but the U.S. Drought Monitor says it would take several consecutive wet winters to fully recharge our state reservoirs. This is uh, the kind of weather that you would like to see continue all through the wet season. We won't know until, say, maybe February or March whether we've had a good wet winter, like it appears to be right now, or whether we're going to be saying, oh, things slowed down and we really 
are still looking at a prolongation of the drought. Reservoir levels and the snowpack are only at half of where they should be right now. California's prison population has shrunk slightly. The state says there are 3,000 fewer inmates now compared to last year. They say changes in state law and sending some prisoners to county jails is contributing to the decline. Most car companies have been slow to adapt to an increasingly connected world, but now cars are starting to catch up. They're becoming more like huge smartphones on wheels. Of course, smartphones can be distracting, so will the car of the future take drivers' minds off the road? KPBS tech reporter David Wagner takes us for a ride. I'm taking this test drive outside the headquarters of Qualcomm. If you know Qualcomm, you probably know them as the company that makes the chips inside our smartphones. But lately, they've been working on another kind of device, cars. So, uh, you know, fundamentally the car is turning into, uh, you know, a smartphone. That's Senior Vice President Conwalinder Singh. In fact, Audi, the car we're driving, calls the car the world's largest smartphone. I'm behind the wheel of an Audi A3, the first car to have its own 4G connection. It has internet radio, more detailed Google Maps, Netflix streaming for the kids in the back seat. Drivers can dictate tweets using voice command. And the car reads incoming text messages out loud. Hope you're not texting and driving. Singh says Qualcomm's long-term goal is to power self-driving cars, to take human drivers out of the equation entirely. But that's a long way off. For now, they're tricking out cars with the kinds of features we've come to expect on our phones. And if this all sounds terribly distracting for the driver, Singh says it's just the opposite. We believe that driver distraction would actually be... be alleviated by providing these services through the car. Singh says today, drivers are constantly tempted to look down at their phones. He doesn't trust them to resist the urge. So he says, let's give them a safer way to stay connected while behind the wheel. When all this is embedded, like it is in this, in this Audi, uh, phone calls uh, destined to you and your smartphone would actually come through the car's antenna and play through the car's audiovisual system and you would interact through the car. The dangers of the job now are distracted driving. Inside a classroom full of people who drive for a living, we hear a different kind of pitch. Here, professional drivers are told to focus on one thing and one thing only when they're behind the wheel, driving. This driving safety class is put on by a team of UC San Diego School of Medicine researchers. Our center is called TREADS. The training, research, and education for driving safety. Professor Linda Hill is in charge of the program. She sees all this technology coming to the car as a public health problem. 26% of injury crashes now involve a distraction that's using a cell phone. So that was a statistic that didn't even exist 20 or 30 years ago. And she doesn't think companies like Qualcomm are making us any safer. I think they're really ignoring powerful effect of cognitive distractions, and they're just choosing to not deal with that. Hill says, sure, voice command might address visual distraction, preventing drivers from staring down into their laps. But eye tracking studies have shown that even when drivers have their hands free and their eyes on the road, their mind can still be elsewhere. What you see through the windshield is reduced by 50 percent when somebody's talking to you on the phone. As for text messaging, voice command might even make things worse. Play CD. Tuning to AM 850. Oh, heavens. <laughs> and a recent study looking at that found that the voice to text increased driving errors more on a closed driving course than text to text did. Shockingly, Hill says the research shows there is no truly safe way to stay connected while driving. The approach she favors is abstinence only. Using a handheld cell phone while driving has been illegal in California for six years. But a recent study found no evidence that the law reduced accidents. Many experts think drivers just went on using phones despite the ban. Hill's own data reveals that 90 percent of college students admit to using phones while driving. Qualcomm's Conwell Singh says that's exactly why we need to reinvent how drivers get access to the information locked up in their phones. Today, consumers are basically interacting with their smartphones while driving. 
but in the future, you know, if the same service is provided in a safe way, that should help. Hill doesn't buy it, but she does like the idea of building one piece of technology into cars, an app that disables phones in moving vehicles. David Wagner, KPBS News. I'm Gwen Eiffel. On the next news hour, the heavy rains of El Nino threaten one of the oldest and most fragile archaeological sites in the Western Hemisphere. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. What have we have here? San Diego Zoo has a former fugitive living in its reptile house. The white monocled cobra was the subject of a four day snake hunt in Thousand Oaks last fall. Animal Control thinks she was an escaped pet. Of course, it's illegal to keep a cobra as a pet in California. She's in the San Diego Zoo because it has the right kind of anti-venom. Now she just needs a name. The zoo is taking votes and suggestions online. A San Diego County supervisor wants to see more open-air fish markets like the one on the downtown waterfront. Greg Cox says the markets would help revive the local fishing industry. And in the new year, he'll present some proposals for new state laws to allow more of them. He says the waterfront market is selling over a ton of seafood a week. This was the year California beer drinkers were supposed to be able to take beer jugs or growlers into, an, into any brewery and say, fill her up. But KPBS reporter Claire Trageser says there's some holdouts among San Diego brewers. Mike Hess Brewing in North Park is fairly quiet on a Friday afternoon, except for a few customers who are picking up their beer for the weekend. Edward Wiesel has two growlers with him, one with a Hess label and one that's blank. Last year, Hess would only have been allowed to fill the growler with its label on it. But a California law changed that this year. Now customers like Wiesel can bring most any growler into Hess and get it filled. What I really like too is also that I can bring in a blank growler to fill it up for me um, because it can get pretty difficult to have a growler from every brewery in town. So any brewery that will fill up a blank, blank growler for me, really, it's really nice. Hess's bartender Drew Lopez says it's not just blank growlers they'll fill. We're definitely still filling all of our own growlers and we will fill growlers from other breweries. They just have to meet some certain requirements. One, they have to be either brown glass or stainless steel. They have to um, have the logos covered up. The logos have to be covered so the beer inside is accurately labeled. Also, Hess wants growlers to have latch tops, not screw caps. And for those without growlers, Hess will also can beer on the spot in what they call a prowler. So this is, this is the can, you know, this is what we start out with. Like I said, it's, it's just an empty 32 ounce can. It's got no lid on it. That's what I have right here. And then uh, once the, the can is full, We'll slap the lid on top and then we'll seal it. But not all breweries are like Hess. It's up to each one to decide whether it'll accept outside growlers. And some, like Lost Abbey and Green Flash, don't. Beer enthusiasts are documenting each brewery's policy in lists and spreadsheets online. Customer Wiesel says he still visits breweries that don't have flexible refill policies, but... It makes me less likely to necessarily continue to go over and over again. I'll definitely go to try it out. And if I really like it, I might buy a growler from there. But with a blank growler, if I can fill it up at the brewery, I'm more likely to go back. I'm more likely to, you know, bring a blank growler to a brewery I've never been to and go, oh, wow, that's really good. I think I'll grab some and take it home with me. And that's just what Wiesel did, filling his growlers with Hess's cream ale and stout to enjoy later at home. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. Well, it felt more like summer outside today, but keep your sweaters handy. Temperatures are still expected to drop around the county by Christmas Day from the low 70s to the low 60s uh, beachside. Inland Valley will also see a cool down with a mix of sun and clouds on Thursday. Mountain temperatures will get really chilly from the upper 50s into the mid 40s in the daytime, 30s at night. Even the desert will stay uh, right below the 70 degree mark, going down to the 30s and 40s at night. Let's recap some of our top stories now. Gay activists are questioning a federal move to end a ban on blood donations from gay and bisexual men. The Food and Drug Administration says it wants to change the rules, only banning donations from gay men who've had sex in the previous 12 months. Now, the activists say a celibacy requirement is still a de facto ban. The current policy dates back to the beginning of the AIDS crisis as an effort to protect the blood supply. 
Many medical groups say it's no longer supported by science. The new proposal would put the U.S. in line with other countries. Hey, handsome. Merry Christmas. You like this? Fewer people are answering the Salvation Army's bell. Donations are down 21 percent in San Diego County, leaving the charity about $130,000 short of its goal for the year. The annual Red Kettle campaign runs through tomorrow. A hazmat team and federal health officials were called to the Otay Mesa border crossing today because of an Ebola scare. Authorities reported a pregnant woman possibly met the profile of an Ebola patient with fever, vomiting, and nausea, and a recent visit to Africa. Turns out she had the flu, and her Africa visit was to Nigeria, which has had uh, no Ebola outbreak. She was taken to a hospital for treatment. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.